Well, good day and welcome back. Well, if you are new to typewriters and you're wondering, what can I do with my typewriter besides typing the great American or the great European novel? How about typing letters. That's right. Letter writing or typewriting letters is a whole nother subgenre of the typewriter world. And I'd like to talk today a little bit about how I get along with typewriting letters. Stay tuned. One of the first things I noticed when I became a typewriter letter writer is the letters I received were oftentimes typed on really high quality paper and oftentimes included little treatments like custom printed letterheads or really nifty stamps. And I started realizing that writing letters to other people is not the same thing as typing your own journal writings to yourself. For instance, I have this binder. I have several of them full of typewritten journal articles. And these are typed on all kinds of different paper, and it's just writings for myself. And so I may not be as critical about the quality of writing or about whether there are typographical errors or neatness or whatever. None of that really applies to me personally because I'm writing for myself. But I discovered when I was writing for other people that all of a sudden the appearance of the typewritten text, the quality of the paper, how clean or dark the ribbon is, how clean the type slugs are, how nice of an imprint the typewriter makes, all of that I become self-conscious about. You may or may not be the same way as me, or you might have a different sense of it, but I discovered I had to kind of up my game in terms of neatness. So I started using some nicer papers, and I discovered the Southworth brand of resume papers, at least here in the United States, is readily available at a lot of your big box office supply stores, like Staples is the one that's closest to me. So I have like white, and there is a kind of a grayish parchment. There is the more parchment colored parchment paper. There's also this cream colored linen type paper. And it's nice to have the heavier grades of paper to write letters on. And also, this paper is 32 pound paper and some of the others are 30 pounds, some of it's 24. But the heavier grades of paper serve as their own backing sheet. So in other words, if you have a really hard platen and it causes some negative effects on the appearance of the letters, or punches through too hard to the back side of the paper, having the thicker paper kind of helps mitigate that. But I don't always stick to that rule about high quality resume paper. I have mail letters typed on a lot of different kinds of paper, like for instance, this is the Paycon brand newsprint paper. So newsprint paper is gonna be this more grayish, off-white, almost cream colored paper, much thinner than resume paper. It will punch through on the back side if you have a hard platen, but it's kind of a nice quality paper in the sense that it's newsprint, it's designed for oil-based ink, and it reminds me of a lot of the old style typing papers from back in the typewriter era. So I don't always stick to my rule about high quality, thick, luscious, textured resume papers, but that is something you'll find a lot of typewriter letter writers do use. And so now we come to the topic of letterheads. That's right. I was for a long time receiving beautifully printed letterhead paper on the letters that people sent me, and I didn't have a nice letterhead to reply to them with. And so one day I decided I'm going to sit down, uh, open up some software on my computer, and I'm going to make myself a letterhead. And it's been really nice having now my own letterhead. I have my address at the bottom, and I print this out with a laser printer on different types of the resume paper. So I've had good response from people. It's been a lot of fun. And if I do, in fact, go to more than one page, in the letter, I'll typically use the same paper but without the letterhead for the second and subsequent sheets. Just because I think it's nice to have the letterhead on the top sheet but not necessarily on the remaining sheets. But even though I have my own letterhead now, there are people that have done high quality scans of real genuine letterpress style letterhead, beautiful artwork, line work, and those are just gorgeous. They're old engravings from the 19th century, letterheads with ornate letters and all that. That's really beautiful. That's a whole other genre in itself, is making a letter with a letterhead look like it was period from the era of your typewriter. 
So now we come to the topic of typographical errors. So I might find it acceptable to have typographical errors like lengthy strike throughs like I've done here in my private journal typings. But I find myself a lot more self-conscious about sending out a letter to someone with this kind of what I call sloppy corrections. Even though there's really no rules per se. It's sort of like when you invite just a passing person that you are only casually acquainted with into your house. Everything about your house reflects upon who you are as a person, even though in an honest relationship, we should be able to overlook the dirt on the floor and the fact that I have a food stain or maybe on my shirt and whatever, right? The floor's not clean and the kitchen's dirty. The same thing with letters, right? In truth, we should be accepting of however the letter looks. We should just be happy to receive a typewritten letter from someone. They took the time to type out a letter and mail it to us. It costed them money to do it. But I still feel, in spite of all that, that, yeah, it shouldn't matter what the letter looks like. And also, I should at this point say, I am very open to corrections, obvious corrections on paper. It doesn't bother me. In fact, I like to see personally the evidence of the writing process, even with strike throughs or whatever. On the other hand, when I'm writing a letter for people, I'm much more self-conscious about it. I try to use correction tabs or roll-on correction tape, which doesn't always work, by the way, with off-white paper or that copper-colored parchment resume paper. White out of any kind just doesn't work. And so, Anyways, I'm trying to get better about the whole idea of corrections and having a perfect, pristine letter. I know some of the people out there who've sent me letters, they type a rough draft, and then they type a final draft without any errors. They go to the trouble of retyping. That tells me that there's people out there who really are serious about putting out error-free letters. And I'm just wanting to make you aware that if you're the kind of a person who doesn't want to do that or feels that a letter of any kind should be acceptable, just be aware there are people out there who want a perfect letter. I'm always self-conscious about it myself, even though when I try to make corrections, oftentimes it looks worse than just leaving it the way it was or striking it out anyways. As like I say, especially on the copper colored paper, you really can't do anything but strike it out or ignore it. So one of the other joys I find in letter writing is as you proceed to write more and more letters, you'll slowly start finding yourself doing certain things. You'll pick up maybe certain little tricks from other letter writers, but you'll develop your own thing. I remember finding this trefoil stamp at a downtown Portland, Oregon stationery store back in the early 2000s. And I've used that with red ink for years to stamp my signature as a little chop. And that's become my little style, little thing that I do that's maybe different from other people. For myself, I like to find my own style, a little bit different way of doing letters. And I've also received letters from people with the same kind of personalized style. I remember one person sent me a letter where the whole thing was a was typed in four different directions as a spiral of text going outwards all the way out to the outside edge of the paper. And I thought that was so unique and took a lot of effort to do, which meant a lot to me. So find your own style that maybe is a blend between classic old letters and some new graphic design kind of effect also you can do. One of my correspondents, in fact, Thomas, is really good about typography on his letters. He uses like parentheses with a couple other symbols at the top to make a little typographical decoration. And that's his style. And I notice certain letter writers are much more particular about print quality and typography, which really means a lot to me. And now we get into the topic of envelope sizes. So most of us are going to use an envelope to mail our letter. Keeping in mind, there's a way to turn your letter into an envelope, which we'll talk about shortly. But here in the United States, there are some common envelope sizes 
The larger ones for letters that are most common is called a number 10 envelope. And then there are smaller envelopes that are also common. These are called number six and three quarters. So how you envelop your letter has a lot to do with the kind of paper you're using. The thicker kinds of resume papers, I find, work better folded in a more conventional three folds or two folds in a larger envelope. Whereas if you're using thinner paper, you can get away with folding a full letter size sheet into a smaller envelope. So for folding a letter that is rather thick uh, for a number 10 envelope, I usually fold it in thirds. So crease it, crease it like that. And now it's ready to be put into a number 10 envelope. And sometimes I add little treats, little envelope stuffers, stickers, or cool little things I've found. I'll stick them in the letter here and then put them in a number 10 envelope. A lot of people like to use the smaller size envelopes. In the US, these are known as six and three quarter size. And so for a full size letter sheet, um, to fold it into that, uh, there are several ways of doing it. One of the ways is you fold the letter from bottom up to the top and then fold this into approximate thirds. And that becomes a nice little package that goes right into one of these six and three quarter size envelopes like that. But also back in the old days, uh, before I was born even, um, Paper was rather expensive, and so a lot of people used the letter as its own envelope. So if this was, if this was the written side, that's my letter. So if I was going to now fold this into its own envelope, there are several ways of doing it. So one way is you want to make a horizontal fold just to define the halfway point, and then you want to take the top left corner, fold it down to that fold. Take the bottom right corner, bring it up to that same middle fold like that. And now you're going to have these two rectangular areas. And what you do with them is you fold those in to match the other edge. So you have that. This one the same way. You fold it in to match the edge there. Crease it. And now you have this weird trapezoid shape thing. What you do is you bring up the bottom to that same center fold crease it and then tuck it in. And then you take the top down to that same center fold, crease it and then tuck the corner in. And then you're going to use either adhesive tape or adhesive stickers to put on the outside just to keep these closed. And then if you've done it right, the upper right corner is now a complete angle. This corner is available for the postage. You don't want to have the truncated corner on the upper right because the postal service may reject the letter. Anyway, this leaves you with the room for the postage and the postmark and your address. You can put your return address on the back. So this is one good way to do a self-enveloped letter. It's a fun thing to do and it will save you on using envelopes, obviously, but a lot of people like to put wax seals on these. And in the old days, like hundreds of years ago, wax seals was the way that letters were sealed. And it was a security measure. You can't open it without breaking the seal. And so you can tell it's a witness whether it's been tampered with. However, nowadays, at least in the United States, the Postal Service will charge you extra postage if you have a wax seal on the outside of your envelope, because they have to hand cancel it instead of machine canceling it. Unless you like to pay extra postage, I advise you not to use wax seals on the outside of your envelope. Use tape, or better yet. So here's a nice thing I like doing. This is another one of these personal style things. Whether it's putting stickers on the back of a self-folded letter envelope, or decorative stickers on the back side of a regular, like a number 10 envelope, I went on to maybe Amazon somewhere, and I got a bunch of these adhesive kind of things. And people who have written me letters will recognize these as uh, the ones I use. These are decorative stickers of different kinds and varieties that I use on my letters that I send out. And usually I'll put one of these on the back of the envelope, like right along here. And then also we have some decorative reproduction stamps. They're not actual original stamps, but they're inspired by stamps. These are just peel off and stick on. There's a bunch of different styles, including astronomy and old 
book things and flowers and butterflies and more flowers and yes, psychedelic, I mean, uh, mushrooms. And anyways, there's a lot of different styles here that you can use for these little adhesive decorative stickers for the outsides of envelopes. And this is another fun thing to do with letter writing. Now here's another thing I've been in the habit of doing recently is when I archive the letters from people, I will oftentimes cut out their canceled stamps if they're especially decorative. If it's a standard U.S. flag, whatever, I probably won't save it, but these are like uh, some Canadian stamps, for instance. I will cut these out. This is the envelope itself that they were stuck to. I'll cut them out and then I will use a glue stick and I will stick these as decoration on the back side of other envelopes. And they can cut that out and then save it if they're a philatelist or steam off the stamps and save them separately. Well, invariably, when you start writing people letters, they often write back. Or if you sign up to Type Pals and mark on your profile that you would like to receive letters or cards, then you start suddenly receiving letters and cards, and that kind of starts to present a little fun challenge of its own. Namely, how do you organize and keep track of all your typewritten letters? Well, I have a little system, and I'm not saying it's the only system you should be using, but it is the one that I use, which is, first of all, incoming letters. How do I organize them? How do I stage them to be responded to? Well, I just use a little plastic binder envelope like this, and I have a piece of tape on here that says, to be answered, this is the to be answered pile, and the newest is on top. So whenever I get a new letter in, it goes into the front here. And so when I'm ready to write a response, to write another letter, I reach into the back of the pile. That also reminds me, I date stamp my cards and letters and envelopes when I get them also. So having a date stamp is a really good idea. I stamp both the outside of the envelope and the letter itself on the letter typically in the upper right corner. And it helps me to track not only when I receive the letter and I can tell how long it's been sitting around by the time I respond, but it also gives me a sense of how quickly the letter took to ship to me through the postal service. Now this is just something I like to do, but I use a pair of pinking shears when I cut open the letter typically, and then, then it's easier for me to tell which side of the envelope has been cut open, typically on the side. Well, as you write more letters and receive more letters, you're eventually going to have to figure out how to deal with the stack of letters that you've received. And what I started doing initially was putting them in a kind of an envelope like that, but they got to be out of hand. Then you put a rubber band around it and then it gets bigger. Well, what I finally did is I got one of these three ring binders and some alphabetized A through Z, A through Z for us Canadian friends, divider tabs. And then I just alphabetize everybody's letters by their last name, three hole punch them and put them in the binder here. And so that has kind of worked for me. And eventually now I'm outgrowing the one binder I'm gonna to have to start using another binder, but other people will have a file cabinet, three, four drawer file cabinet, and they'll start putting all the letters in and, or banker's boxes, right? Those kind of document boxes, maybe just store all the letters by, by alphabetical order, and then you might have to put them up in the attic or in the basement or whatever, so you can go dig them out and refer to them when you find another letter from a correspondent and you want to refer back to a previous letter, which is always helpful to do. That's why it's nice to archive letters. But if you are a regular typewriter correspondent, you will have to deal with the issue of what to do with all the letters that you receive. So keeping good track of who you've written letters to can be challenging. Generally, you know who you received a letter from because you're saving their letters, but I have a little booklet. I make these handmade staple bound books and I just write in there the name of the person, whether it was a letter or postcard, and the date that I mailed it. So I have a chronological list of everybody's letters that I've sent. And so I can think back to myself, you know, if I look through my binder of letters waiting to be written and I'll say, 
when did I last write that guy? I can go look in this book here and say, oh, way back then. So that's one thing to do. So then the other thing to do, I showed you earlier my three ring binder, alphabetical dividers, how I archive letters. And what I do for that is I will take their envelope and I will cut their return address off the envelope and I will glue it with a glue stick onto the front side of their letter. So I don't actually save their envelope. I do cut off the stamps, as I said earlier, if they're decorative. I may have a record of their previous address somewhere, but maybe they've changed addresses. So this is a way that you always take their latest address, cut it out, glue stick it to their letter. It's stamped with the date that I received the letter, right? And it's written the date that I wrote back to them on the letter, and then I have their return address glued to the letter. So that one letter stuck in my binder has all the information I need about when I received the letter, when I wrote back, and what their current return address is. So it's good to do that because people do move around. You don't want to lose touch of where they're living. If you're using regular envelopes to typewrite addresses on, first of all, the smaller size envelopes, you can generally use any kind of a typewriter. But I find for the number 10 envelopes, not every typewriter will fit a number 10 envelope. So I find that the Royal Mercury is a surprisingly good little typewriter for addressing number 10 envelopes. It's a small typewriter, but if you move the left margin all the way out to the far left, then it'll take a number 10 envelope. It's wide enough for it, which is really nice. So I like to open up the flap of the envelope like that when I thread it in. That way there's a little bit less thickness of paper to deal with. Then I can start on the very left with the return address here. This is a pica size typeface, so out to about 47 on the paper scale is a pl good place to begin the recipient's address right there, about halfway down. On the other hand, a medium sized portable like this Optima Super, a lot of the European typewriters won't take number 10 envelopes because they were designed for the European letter size letters. So in this case, you can't quite fit a number 10 envelope in there with the letter guide all the way to the left. The paper bale is just a little bit too thin. So the smaller Royal Mercury ends up being better than this otherwise superior Optima typewriter. So you do have to look at the width of the typewriter carriage as to whether it'll take a number 10 envelope. Otherwise, you can use the smaller envelopes as I indicated, but those are better suited for thinner weights of paper because you have to do more folds on the paper to get them in the smaller envelopes. So one of the things I really like about letter writing is you become friends with a lot of people that you otherwise wouldn't become friends with. This is my friend Bill and he's always giving me some kind of a title in the address line of the letter. I think he was referring to a few years ago, my friend Kevin and I took a Amtrak train ride up to northern New Mexico with our typewriter. So Bill is humorous enough to include this kind of fun stuff. And that's just another fun aspect of developing relationships with people through the written word. Well, if you're new to typewriters and are trying to figure out what can I do with my typewriter besides typing random nonsense late at night, making an effort to type letters to other typewriter aficionados around your country and around the world. And what better way to do that than to get on to typepels.com website and sign up to Type Pals, become a member, and then once you become a member, you can put into your profile, check the box saying, yes, I want to receive cards and letters. And then other people will be able to see your postal address as a member, other members, and they will write you and you can write them. So that's a great way to develop new relationships with other typewriter people around the country, and around the world. What a great thing to do with your typewriter. And personally for me, Letter writing has been a very fulfilling thing to do with my typewriters. It keeps me sharp. It keeps me focused. It helps elevate my typing game so that I can put out a better quality typed letters to people. So I encourage you, get the typewriter out, put it on your desk, sign up to Type Pals, and start becoming a pen pal, a typewriter correspondent with other typewriter users. And that's another aspect of how you can be creative with your typewriter. And stay creative.
and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.